Now, the reason this presentation and the whole meeting was that it's not your grandfather's wells is you have to take into consideration that we have a 150 year history in West Virginia of oil and gas operations. First well was built in 1858 or something like that. So we have 50 to 60 years of laws and regulations and enforcement traditions centered around what is called conventional wells or our grandfather's wells. Those are some of the old wells. You'll see these all over the state, for, especially in the area where I live, Tyler, Wetzel, Marshall, Doddridge, Ritchie counties, and so on. Those are just pump jacks and conventional wells. Now, this is in the Lewis Wetzel Wildlife Management Area. And on that well pad is the same vehicle. That well pad is 900 feet long. I haven't measured the width of it. A couple tanks, a couple separators, well heads. Here's the two side by side. Again, same vehicle, nothing has changed in proportion here except for the fact that the modern day Marcellus or horizontal well is huge. Five to 25 acres are used up. So there's a big difference. But our regulations are still not quite evolved from our grandfather's days. They're improving, but they're not there yet. There's another well pad. That circle there is just a some very large earth moving equipment, but that's just to give you a rough size of one of these well beds. It's sort of like mountain top removal on a slightly smaller scale. Standard drill rig. Now, is, can anyone, if you look at this closely, see anything on there that it might look like a pump jack? Does anyone else help here? Hey, that fellow knows what he's doing. What's he pointing to there? Thank you for your help, our fellow here. I'll bring you along next time, too. Um, but what is that? It's that thing. Stuck in the back of that well pad, but dwarfed by it. Right there. So this pump jack is tucked back here at the far end of this well pad. That's a standard horizontal well pad. A rather small one at that. Okay, barring, as it says, a miraculous transformation in our state regulatory, what you see in these slides is what you'll get. It doesn't matter whether you like it or not, this is pretty much what you're going to get. Let's take a look at it. We're going to look at air, traffic, and roads first, and then some air, and then some water. Traffic, truck accidents, road congestion. This is about a quarter mile from my mailbox. Uh, a couple years ago, you'll have massive traffic increase, and there's nothing illegal about this. There's no law that says you can't have more than two or three trucks on the road at one time. Every driver is perfectly legal here, unless he's overweight. Here's the same same road, ice and snow, similar road, traffic congestion. These are parked on a public road because there's no room on a well pad for them. And now. I don't have any suicidal tendencies. Nothing is moving here. Stuck in jammed up traffic on both sides. I'm just walking down between the line of trucks using a film. More trucks waiting. More traffic. and the size of that road, it's a challenge to drive them safely. It's a challenge for the truckers too. The truckers in general do a good job. I am not blaming any truckers here. Big trucks, very small roads. 
Here's a, here's a couple more different trucks, some after they were stuck in a ditch. Here's one that ran off into the ditch and spilled some drill waste. Here's a couple more accidents, some in daylight, some different times of the day, but uh, there's another one there, that's about a quarter mile from my mailbox too, a couple months ago. Here's a few more, and here's a, a couple more, and there's another one in my neighbor's front yard. She doesn't charge for parking, so I don't think they, well, they didn't ask her ahead of time. And there's another couple too. Guardrail damage, you have signs, guardrails, roads, all this stuff is damaged day after day and the highway department cannot keep up. We in Wetzel should have the best roads in the state, but it isn't working out that way. More guardrails and bridges. Now that bridge is probably built in the public works programs of 1930s. It was fine shape, a little weather worn until about a year or two ago. So it lasted for 70 some years or 80 years or so, and now it's pretty well busted up. This is a different bridge, a couple miles away, but it still has been hit by too many truckers. Too many guardrails have lost to the trucks, but they sometimes die in the line of duty. Here's another guardrail taking a beating. Let's move on to air quality. Diesel fumes from on-road trucks is bad, but the diesel fumes from off-road portable power sources is usually worse because it's totally unregulated. So let's look at some of that. Now there's diesel fume during fracturing. Here's just a standard diesel run transfer pump, which is just pumping out of a stream to a holding pond, and you'll see some of the holding ponds here a little later. There's diesel during drilling on a well pad at Tyler County. Um, it was a very old junky drill rig, but they kept on using it. Here's diesel fumes. It, since it's a dark background, I put the circle there so you can see the, uh, there's a little more of a close up. Now this is off-road, non-stationary portable power source. Totally unregulated. It doesn't matter how black they burn, no one cares. Here's diesel during a hydraulic fracturing operation, the ETT well pad, just a few months ago. Now these things aren't from years ago. Some aren't, some aren't, but I haven't seen much change in five years. This is a few months ago. Let's take a look at it. get the picture. I'm standing on a public highway watching hydraulic fracturing, the hydraulic fracturing process. There's probably 30,000 horsepower of diesel pumps running there. And that's what it looks like. That's what it sounds like too. I had earplugs in. My camera didn't have earplugs in. <laughs> this is not unusual, folks. This is what you'll see. This is typical. Here's silica dust. This, the next big uh, problem with uh, the hydraulic fracturing process is the potential for silicosis. This stuff is very light. The same type of silica dust, very light, and it floats away, and it might actually put onto pasture lands or into my neighbor's yards. This is uh, also a couple months ago. seen over five years is at least this fellow here, and I watched him closely for some time, he had a full mask respirator on it, not a free air supply, but it like dust mask. Years ago, they never even wore that. Um, so anyway, let's move on. This is just rock dust. Now, I said that one time, and my neighbor got very pissed off at me. He had a respiratory condition. He said, what do you mean, just rock dust? I can choke on that as easy as silica, or, you know, he's right. So this is rock dust that was floating towards his property. 
Now here's road, road dust in um, this particular lower left one. There's a vehicle in that dust cloud, and I, there's one in here. You can see a little bit better. This is very common also because there'll be dirt and mud and silica. Uh, silica. There'll be uh, limestone dust all over the place. Here's some more road dust. Now this is fumes from a, uh, what's called a uh, triethylene glycol dehydration station. If you want to look, read a little detail here, this says this is adjacent to the disabled hunters access where you have class Q. This is in Lewis Wetzel's wildlife management and also a public hunting grounds. There's a well pad in it and the road goes right through it. Um, okay, more dehydration fumes. This is raw gas fumes being blown off from a valve that was bad. This is just a, a fire and these are not uncommon. The, the unique part of this is it burns about nine days. And here's one uh, last, about a year ago, June 28th in Monroe County, Ohio, right across the river. Uh, I could talk for an hour or more just on this one fire because it's so un interestingly unique and dangerous. Here's a second uh, picture of the same well pad later on in the day. Burning from on-site well pads and pipeline. They're allowed to do this. Here's flaring from well pads or gas processing or Dominion gas processing plant. Water. Big amounts of water are needed and they're drawn out of every stream, every creek, every river, and any, any stream at all that they can get a pipe to and a pump at, they'll do so. Now that is better regulated now than it was six and seven years ago. What's a wildlife management area where a well pad swept over the hillside and left mud for about a year. Same issue here, clean in one point, well activity on the other side. Same thing here from a pipeline. And this is in Doddridge County where there's been a lot of surface wells damaged by the Antero during the drilling process, not during the hydraulic fracturing process. And we can't get into too many details about well casings, but you have to realize that while you're drilling, you don't have the well casing there. That's why you're putting a hole in the ground. You're trying to get, you're trying to get a place to put the well casing. The problems like this occur is while you're drilling. Here's another one and another one. They sort of tuck them way out of sight of sorts. Now, this is in a wildlife management area in Wetzel County. It's one of the dirtier well paths I've seen. Now, I don't know if most of you folks probably couldn't care less about Beach Fork, right? Or maybe some of these other places. This is owned by us. This is managed by the DNR. This is in a wildlife management area, public hunting grounds. That well pad is a deplorable example of how we were managing wells a few years ago. It might be slightly better, but you can go very slightly better from this and still have a long ways to go. That was an explosion from one of these tanks that Put all that crud on the ladies' uh, hayfield. Okay, that's the end of this. But as it says, this is the end of the presentation, but the beginning of your headaches. The Rogersville Shale, coming soon to a neighborhood near you. Let's not make the same mistakes we made with coal. Let's begin to consider ourselves friendly, we want to get along with our neighbors, we just want, you know, we want to, we're good people. Um, I love West Virginians. Other people call us suckers. Uh, we have to be careful. When we, if, if you decide to lease, remember, don't lease for what it's worth to you. Lease for what it's worth to them. Um, the, um, I can't tell with my notes here. I've got notes, so, I'm not, so I'll talk long, but so I won't talk too long. Uh, West Virginia Surface Owners Right Organization, third of our members, our mineral owners, uh, mostly what we do is advocate at the legislature, and we have a website. If you type into your Google search, West Virginia Surface Owners, you will find our website. Um, I can give an hour speech on surface rights. I can give an hour and a half speech on leasing. I can go on for half hour, 45 minutes 
on pipelines. Obviously, we're not going to get a chance to do all that today. Um, at the end, I will stay as long as you folks have questions. Uh, but look, please do go to that website if you have questions. Oh, Bill talked to Just Google West Virginia surface owners. Um, for example, Bill talks about casing. That Bill talked about casing. Uh, that shows what can go wrong with casing if you cause water well problems. Um, if you would like to join us, there you can join on the website or we have handouts back there. And we brought 100 handouts. I sense that wasn't enough. Um, shale drilling, horizontal shale drilling is a big deal. One lady said, you know, is it because it's so deep that it's horizontal? We talked about how deep they go. Then they turn sideways and go 5,000 to 14,000 feet. They go a mile to two miles underneath. I want to clear that up. Um, is it a big deal? Yes, shale drilling is a big deal. Shale is the source rock. For years, we've drilled into sandstone because it's porous and permeable. You can put a vertical well down and crack a little bit. Use maybe a tractor trailer a little water, crack a little bit, the gas will flow to the vertical well bore. Um, but where did that gas came from? It came from shale. And the shale over the eons, the gas migrated out of the shale into the sandstone. So now with horizontal, vertical frack, these huge frack jobs, we, I hate to say we, they uh, have learned how to get the gas out. Um, Bill showed you some of those ponds. Again, an old vertical well used a tractor trailer load of water. These use, I don't know, eight or 10 Olympic swimming pools full of water, some of them nitrogen too. Um, so it's, it's a source rock. How much is it worth? Um, the, the, the Mar up in the Marcellus Shale Bay, I have not studied the Rogersville Shale much. Nobody has. The industry that's drilled well so gets to keep that secret for about a year and a half, a year and four months. Um, but I did analysis of the Marcellus Shale, and the Marcellus Shale is worth, the gas in the Marcellus Shale is worth $85,000 an acre. At the Marcellus Shale, I, I, oh, I, that's the gas. In some areas, some of my clients get as much royalty from the liquids that they sell. So it could be worth $160,000 an acre. So if you're leasing or if you want to take money for a surface owner, get what it's worth to them, not what it used to be worth to you. What's it cost for them to produce that acre? Are we talking about $85,000 profit on the acre? No, $85,000 total worth of gas over the life of the well. It costs three to six million dollars to drill each well. They put two to four to uh, see 14 wells on a pad. I represent one client right now that they have nine wells drilled on the pad. They want to drill three more. The nine wells are already drilled over the life of the wells will produce a quarter billion dollars worth of gas. How many acres does that do nine wells cover? It's about 120 acres per well. Um, so it's a big deal. It's source rock, it's money. Um, there, it's the surface impact. One of the handouts that I sent you is, that we gave you is this. It didn't come out too well. There's a little blue circle over here. That's the conventional well that was drilled about 10, 15 years ago. This is the horizontal well pad that I just talked about right next to it. That's before it went into production. This is that well pad now in production by EQT. And it has a permanent impact. These old wells, you, you ever smell gas from them? Maybe sometimes. According to, the, according to the permit that EQT got for, this, for that bottom well pad, with all these things that Bill was talking about on there, um, the potential to emit um, 92 tons per year of volatile organic compounds, 40 tons per year of other pollutants that are subject to national ambient air quality standards, 26,000 tons of greenhouse gases, eight, eight tons of hazardous air pollutants, and that's after treatment. So it, it's a big deal, it's a big change, I think probably the biggest long-term on the impact of the The change in the culture that's going to be become, become an industrial area that hits here, but it's the air. And then there are pipelines, there are compressor stations, the highways bill showed you. Now, maybe what's going on in the Rogersville shale is exaggerated. What makes me think it might be exaggerated? Um, well, it's pretty good up north right now. The Marcellus is good, it's got liquids. There's the Utica in Ohio. Um, it's shallower, richer generally. I, I, we don't know much about the Rogersville yet, so I'm, I'm thinking maybe they're overhyping it a little bit. Um, another thing is just infrastructure up north. They already have compressors. They're building compressors. They're building the stations that drop the liquids out. They're building the pipelines. Not so much of that here. The other reason is this is a boom and bust. The oil and gas industry is a boom and bust, wild west. All these industries in order to get their investors to give money, talk about how great their perspectives are 
this is going to be the greatest play ever. So I'm going to take it with a grain of salt. Now I understand there's lots of leasing going on here, how serious they are. If I, if I had some kind of a survey about how much they're asking for you, if they're willing to pay you $25 or $100 an acre, or $250 an acre, to just to sign the lease now. That's not the royalty. You make more money off the royalty than you do the signing bonus. Um, then I'd say these guys may be speculating in the case it does come here. They have so much money, they can do that. If they're offering you a thousand or four thousand dollars a year to sign, if they're, arguing, if they're offering you eighteen percent uh, uh, royalty instead of twelve and a half percent royalty, uh, maybe they're more serious about coming here soon. The other reason I'm a little skeptical is OPEC. And OPEC lowered its prices because they don't want us to be energy independent, so they're making it less economical to drill here. So those are the reasons why I think it might not be coming here. Why do I think it might still happen despite that? Um, the North is what they call turfed out. They've all, there was a gang boom rush in 2008 to 2010. Companies, you know, recruiting the landmen out of McDonald's and signing leases all over the place and all intermingled with it. Eventually they kind of are, have different places where they kind of form their own territories. Some companies got left out. They might be coming down here. They can't drill up north, so they're trying to find a way to drill down here. That's a possibility. The companies are coming after you for leases. You have no idea who they're working for. Um, some of those, some of that's intentional because they, some companies don't want other companies to know they get land that down here. Um, so, so why why might it still happen? Some companies are left out. Um, if it's if there's oil in the Rogersville ship, oil is much more valuable than gas. So it produces a lot of oil. That would be a big difference. Uh, the Rogersville shale is older than the Marcellus shale, um, might be more thermally mature. And the other thing is eventually, eventually, your grandchildren, great grandchildren, they'll drill everywhere, you know, we'll, we'll burn all this stuff up. Um, first, I'm going to talk about surface owners things and briefly about pipelines, then a little bit about leasing. Um, I'm not talking as if you only own the surface and didn't have the minerals. We admit that the law is hated. The law is that the mineral owner has the right to do it. It was reasonably necessary to drill to the minerals under you. They can put a road under you. They can put a conventional at least well pad on you. We say, well, but, but we also say that if somebody drills on a neighboring mineral tract, and the, the mineral tract under you might be bigger than your surface tract. If they drill on a neighboring mineral tract to put the well on the surface here, and they want to put a pipeline across you to get that gas out, They've got to get a right away from you, right? And they just can't bring a pipeline across you. So why on earth do they think, even though they can't put a pipeline across you, they can put one of these well pads on you to go wherever you get that. The surface under the neighboring gas. Yeah, they are not only the gas under you, but the neighboring gas up through your surface. And sometimes, even just the neighboring gas. A case that Isaac and I did together, he's, he's the litigator on the old gas guy. Um, you know, they had how many wells that weren't even in the mineral tracks under the surface? Well, there were four wells total, and one of them, three of them didn't go through his tract at all, only getting gas from the neighboring tract and not from that uh, landowner's piece of land. We say that's not legal. Unfortunately, no Supreme Court case has yet decided that. But if you're the surface owner, that's the position you should take. That, no, 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 you can't come on my surface to drill into a neighboring mineral tract. Or if you're of the view, unless you pay me what it's worth to you for your $85,000 an acre worth of gas drained by nine wells and 120 acres. Um, they say, yes, they've got a right to do it. It's reasonably necessary. Um, we have another, we have, uh, hopefully we'll get a, a test case that says that they're wrong. Until then, they're going to either say that or they're going to be quiet and lead you to believe it. Um, the state, unfortunately, stays out of that argument. They are, see themselves as an environmental control agency. As long as they drill it right, they don't care about property rights, who owns the gas, et cetera. Which means they'll issue a permit without looking into any questions of what your deed says and what deed rights you have. That means you have to have an attorney to look at your deed or look at the existing lease to determine whether they have the right to build that well because DEP will not stop them for property rights reasons. They won't read the deed. Find out who it is and buy an interest in the minerals under you. Before they can drill, they have to lease, get a lease signed by every owner of the gas of the minerals. Every single one, all 42 of those people, all 148 of those people. So if you can get one of them, one of them, you can refuse to sign a lease unless, just to keep them off or unless they want to do what you want. For example, no surface use. If your neighbor says it's fine to put a well pad on them and they just want to drill under you and not use your surface, that's a decision you can make. Um, but if, 
And if you have ownership of the gas under you, uh, of, the, of the minerals under you, or the coal under you, that's really good. So that's good. If there's a place you don't want them to put a well pad, drill a water well. It can't be within 250 feet of a water well that's used for some purpose. Do it now. Once they send you a notice they're coming, it's too late. If there's a place that you want to preserve, a family homestead, just a nice field, a nice place you want, drill a well and put it to some kind of use. How many feet? 250 for a horizontal well, 200 for a vertical well. But that keeps them pretty far away. Keeps them further away than that. Negotiate for it. Does the well have to be operational? Yeah, it has to be used for something. Okay. It can be used for your cows. Can be used for your cows. I'm not sure wildlife works, but that's that's all it is. Put a salt lake there. Show deer, take pictures of deer tracks, something. <laughs> Another idea I came up with is negotiate for the, if the mineral owner won't sell to you, say, look, I'll take care of this. You let me negotiate the lease to protect me, and I'll try to get you a higher percentage. If you end up stuck in litigation, and they start asking you questions. Well, it was some time back then I talked to him. What was his name? Not credible, not a good case. Uh, keep a journal. Um, don't get mad, ask for a supervisor. Somebody who's not want to do something on your surface, you know, usually they're going to try and treat you like they're going to charm you, or these guys are used to be used car salesmen. Um, but but, but don't, don't get mad at them and do something like threaten them, because they're going to use that against you later. What you should say is, may I speak to your surface owner? He'll go on and on. May I speak to your surface owner? And if he doesn't, you, you, I'm sorry, yeah. supervisor. Let me speak to your supervisor. He said that. He talks about it. Let me speak to your supervisor. Then give up on that and instead go call the president of the company and say that you, this guy won't let you talk to a supervisor. If you can't work from the bottom up, work from the top down. Um, take pictures. You ever try to argue with a picture? Take pictures of what your land looks like now before they come in. People taking pictures that take well, this digital cameras you can't. Taking pictures is cheap. You don't even have to print them. Just take them. <coughs> and date them. And date them. Leasing, this, is, this, this piece of paper, again, can be found on our website. But my top six pieces of leasing advice is don't be rushed. These landmen are going to be in a hurry. The more hurry they are, the less you want to, the less you want, they want you to be able to learn about your situation. Don't be rushed. Your grandchildren, your great grandchildren, are going to be influenced by what you sign today. Don't be rushed to sign that day. Understand what you are signing. On again, on the Surface Owners Rights Organization, there is a a, a 20-page document I've written on leasing. Read it at least. Um, there is nothing called a standard lease. They will have to. So this is our standard lease. That's when you sign for a mortgage. When you sign for a car. You sign paperwork, uh, about 75% of the language in that paperwork is dictated by a Consumer Protection Act, Consumer Rule, State or Federal. When you sign an oil and gas lease, every single word was drafted by the company lawyer. And the longer it is, the worse it is for you because the more they're protecting you. That's right. I suggest to you that there's no, that there's just a standard document and that you have no negotiating power. It's just not true. Um, Can you speak up? We can't hear everyone's talking. All right, I will try to talk to you even louder get closer to this microphone. But there are things that you should scratch out. For example, one example, uh, there will be something in there called a general warranty. What that means is when you sign the lease, they're going to have their title manager down and their lawyer do a title examination to make sure that you own the oil and gas that you're signing away. If their lawyer makes a mistake, if you sign a general warranty, that means when they get sued, you will have to hire the company's lawyer to protect them from their bad title search. That's the kind of stuff that's in that lease. That's in every lease I've ever seen. So you want to scratch that stuff out, you can do an addendum and add stuff. That's usually how it's done, too. Join with your neighbors. Get bargaining leverage. 600 acres is my ideal. I've seen thousands and thousands of acres. you got to be careful with big, big groups because people have different different agendas. Some people are just in it saying, this is the, you know, I want to make money, this is an industrial, this is a commercial project. Other people have come to they want to protect their farms. So make sure the groups can get too big, but it's definitely good to get with your neighbors. If the guy walks into you and says, okay, if you don't sign today, I'm going to go sign up your neighbors and we'll just drain up underneath you. First of all, with the shale, that's not true. Because if the gas moves through the shale at very slow levels. So, but when he walks out the door, put your hat on, and you go talk to the neighbors, and you all get together, and you <coughs> sign together, and hire a lawyer together. Or not sign. Or 
not sign. You do not have to sign. Um, shop around. It's just because one guy comes and offers you a lease. If you want more, go find somebody else. Get out of the get out of the record book and see what companies are doing title research and see who you can talk to. Um, join our surface organization. Now, uh, what, during the break, two people have come to me and asked about force pooling. What if they get everything around you? Will the legislature pass a force pooling statute? Again, please look on our website to see our position on force pooling. Right now, well, a good force pooling bill is a good thing. The industry has not introduced a good force pooling bill. A good force pooling bill does things for you and things for the for the company. The, the bills they've introduced just does good things for the companies to help them drill, not to protect you. However, it, 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 again, a good force pooling bill is a good thing because if they won't give you enough money to make you happy, then, you, then if you do get force pooled, you can go to the commission and say, I want more money than they offered me. And, and this commission currently, that works for deep wells, has done that. So a good force pooling bill is a good thing. Um, you may get more. And also, none of the force pooling bills that have been introduced, they cannot force a well on your surface. So even if they force the minerals under you, the agency cannot make them put a well site on you, but so have to take the well site elsewhere. And that is three one and a half hour speeches. <laughs> uh, we ask for questions. Isaac says, no, well, so someone uh, submitted a written couple of written questions. Uh, I will, uh, and I will uh, read them and then, and then we'll try to answer them. First one is if I own the mineral but have an existing natural gas lease, do I still control fr fracking rights to my property? Well, if it's an existing lease that's held by production, your life rights may be limited. I think it depends very much on what that lease says and what they propose to do in the new one. So if it's, if it's an existing gas lease, there's gas being produced uh, off of the property, you may have very limited rights on that. If, if, if the existing lease has a pooling clause, you are kind of stuck. If the existing lease does not have a pooling clause that lets them join your property with the neighbors that join a horizontal well, then you're in a reasonably good bargaining position where they'll say, this lease is old-fashioned, we need a pooling clause. And we say, you're right, it is old-fashioned. We need the royalty to go from 12% to 18% and a pooling clause. Uh, doesn't all, don't always get it, but depends on, a lot of this depends on what the lease says and the old ones are drafted by their lawyer, read carefully. I wrote both those questions as they presume that this is grandpa's lease, or great-grandpa's lease, the whole ancient lease. Yeah, how do you find out about those leases? Really, really old ones. If, if there's, uh, most leases have a primary term and a secondary term. The primary term says they have to drill a well within a certain period of time. The old leases set a month or two. The newest leases give them five years to drill a well. Once they drill a well, as long as they continue to produce from your land in paying quantities, the lease is in effect. So I see 1902 leases that are still being held by production, uh, and so the lease is still in effect, unless, of course, they need a pooling clause to drill horizontal. So are they on record somewhere? Oh, yeah. A yeah. lease like that you should be able to find in the courthouse. On an old, old uh, lease. Nowadays they often record just a memorandum of lease, but a 1902 lease or pre-war lease, you, will, you should be able to find it in the courthouse. Could be possible state archives also. State archives has county records. It right. says the man who works for, for state archives. <laughs> <laughs> I think this is a related question uh, from the same gentleman. If I own the mineral but have a coal severance lease, do I still control fracking rights to my property? Well, if you own the coal, uh, and, and, and you're in a golden position because the, you know, we, we can't get stuff through the legislature, but the coal companies can. The coal companies don't like wells clo drilled close together on because it makes it hard to coal. So there's a, a shallow well review board. If the oil and gas driller wants to drill wells too, uh, too close together, the coal owner can eject. So if you own the coal, mine the coal, uh, and they want to put eight wells on a pad, you can say, no, I'm sorry, they have to be 500 feet apart. Uh, and it gives you a bargaining leverage to keep them off and negotiate what you want. There's another question about water pollution. Does it cause water uh, pollution fouling of the water? That operators can definitely foul the water. Uh, they, you know, poor operations on the surface, spills on the surface, poorly constructed ponds on the surface can, can get into uh, get into your drinking water wells. It doesn't happen on every well, at least that's what I've seen is that it doesn't happen on every well. It certainly can happen, which is why it's a good idea, as Dave said, to have your water well tested. That, that's not what the question asked, though. Specifically, 10 days ago, the EPA came out and said, the 
Petroleum Institute is saying that they said fracking does not pollute gas groundwater. Follow up. The, the EPA study says we have not shown that fracking causes the cause of pollution. It said also we have not shown that fracking does not cause pollution. Very good. But if we're doing I don't know. One of the things the EPA said is we couldn't get all the data because um, a lot of people where they had had water pollution and they got a settlement from it, it they had to sign a non-disclosure agreement. So nobody really knows. Okay. So they don't have all the data. But, That's, they, but they did say that fracking does cause water pollution in, it's some, not, right. in some cases. They give examples and they mention 36 wells they looked at in Pennsylvania of those 36 drinking water wells, 25% of them were contaminated by fracking. Yes, ma'am. I'm sorry. Yes. Where, what company is uh, very good at testing water wells that the court would recognize? As a general rule, they're pretty good at testing water wells because they farm it out to, to water well testing companies. But there was a problem with the one down in Beckley and, and Cole. Uh, pretty much. Can you name one around uh, here? We use uh, downstream strategies a lot. They have an office in Morgantown, an office in Alderson, and they're very good at water talks about it. Okay. Downstream strategies, okay. and they have an office in Morgantown. I think their website is downstreamstrategies.com. Yeah, if all you've got is a, one single pipe coming out of the ground full of cement, that's a marker for the well that's plugged. Unfortunately, years ago, they plugged it with very hard substances like hickory logs because that was better than time. Um, and when I first started in this in the 1980s, the director of the oil and gas, Office of Oil and Gas, who was then in his 50s, so he started out when he was 20, plugging wells. And they would go to a well that need plugged, and they would buy a bunch of sacks of cement, and they'd pour all the cement down. And then they'd call the inspector, and the inspector would count the sacks and say, great, that well's been plugged. And then they would drive to the next well, not throw away the sacks. <laughs> Use one sack to plug the next well, kill time for two days, call the inspector and say, look, there's the sacks of all the cement. So there can be problems with those wells, and if someone's really near you, you want to find out about those wells, make sure the driller knows about those wells. If they don't, if it was drilled prior to 1929, they may not know the wells there. So you make sure that anybody really near you knows about that well and knows that you know about that well. Okay, and I have one other question. Yeah. By the way, that, that real is capped off has a gas company's logo, name, everything on it. That's good. Awesome. And, and uh, the other question I wanted to ask you was, I have two live wells on my property with permits that people are getting the royalties from, but not me. Yeah, I'm not getting the royalties. told to be one of them. Our house right. is actually built. We're not getting one. We're not getting the and we called the gas company. By the way, gas companies switch names a lot to Ooh. keep the juggle going out. Yeah. We figured that out ourselves. They just changed the name of the gas company and tried to duck it again. Yeah, I've seen it go through. Okay, what company do I work for? Oh yeah. Right. Okay, well, I want, what I like to know is how can I address this this royalty if, situation that I if, I've been for sixteen years with no royalty payment. If you only own the surface. I own, I own the rights, mineral rights and the surface rights. Right. Okay. And the law is as this day was saying earlier, that they have the right to do what's reasonably necessary to get their property, which is the mineral, off of your property, which is the surface, to compensate you for the damage, produce the gas, and then leave it. And the law doesn't look at that as a taking of your property, it looks at it as something that was reasonably necessary to get their property, the gas, out and sold. Is that what you were talking about? Yeah, so, so private industry can just come on your property and there's no protection on the 14th Amendment. Yeah. Well, he said what he said. Okay. Well, you, you put it down, please. No, I'm saying you do have rights and you, you do have service rights, and that's a lot of what Dave was talking about. So I'm not at all saying you don't have rights. And you know, and your deed is very important to know about if they want to if they come on your property. So if you think that they're exceeding what they were granted in that deed, call somebody, call you know, call one of us, do something about it. I'm not at all saying you have no revenue. They do, but the law does give them the right to use part of that surface if they own the rights to the minerals underneath. They can use the MFLA to force the pipeline to the property. To force an interstate transmission line, one of those big 30 inch things. There's a law there's there's a long uh, process that the uh, Federal Energy Regulatory Commission goes through. If they come to you and say, 
we've got a right to eminent domain of this pipeline. Say, okay, you bring me the piece of paper that says that, and we can talk, and they'll go away. There's a process for you. Sure. This is for either either of you. Can somebody explain to me how the mineral rights of the West Soul Wildlife Management Area got given to a gas company? The DNR is a division of the Commerce Department of the State of West Virginia. So they use it like they do forestry, logging, tours, jobs, jobs. So they see it as a money maker. Now, in Lewis Wetzel Wildlife Management Area, a lot of that land, the state also did not own the mineral rights. Okay, Maybe 500 acres out of 13,000 acres. However, the problem is, and you'll have it at any state park, wildlife management area, is that the DNR, the guys that we might know in the DNR, want to do a good job to protect the natural resources in the state parks and the wildlife management areas. But they've been told, the way I've been told it, that if there's environmental infractions, look the other way, ignore it, the Office of Oil and Gas, which is part of the DEP, if they're so inclined, and if they have time, they might get around to doing some environmental enforcement to provide some adult supervision for the gas guys. So the DNR was told it's none of your business. Even though you manage the state parks and the wildlife management areas, the drillers pretty much could do what they wanted. That's possibly changing some. But that's why it was such an atrocious abuse of publicly owned lands. It takes people who are concerned and people who are interested in getting involved and getting active and putting pressure on whatever the good pressure points are in the state to make things happen. So that's really important for you to, that's a, a really important takeaway. You know, when I started doing environmental work, like as a volunteer years ago, I thought if you tell the agency it wasn't doing its job, that's all it took. But that was wrong. <laughs> and, you know, I learned that lesson the hard way. And so, um, you know, as much as we would really like them, it's the squeaky wheel. It really is the squeaky wheel that gets the grease. Um, and maybe it's the oil and the grease here. But anyway, then one other thing I want you to know too is that we're planning to have like follow-up meetings. We want to have a forum similar to this in some other counties, but we also want to have some community meetings for people who are deeply interested in preserving the air, the water, the land for their children, their grandchildren, and future generations. If you're interested in that, I think somewhere around July 7th or 8th, OVEC will be having a, another community meeting and our website, if you haven't written this down, and, and you on the front page it always says this is the next thing that's going on for us. So it's right up there on the very front page, our calendar. Um, o, H, H is in Henry, V is in Victor, E is in everything, C is in cat.org. So I just wanted you to remember that. And I would like to let Diane, Diane is the founder of OVEC, and uh, this community, believe it or not, is a lot better off because Diane moved here and saw the need to have groups like OVEC where we work with ordinary people to get things done and we've had a lot of victories. Otherwise, we would have a pulp and paper mill right up, up river from us, you know, 15 miles away. We don't have that. They do want to frack under the river, just in case you didn't know that. There, there are plans, that the state's already, yeah, the state's already leased some rights to frack under the Ohio River, which serves three million people um, in in this area. So anyway, Diane, do you want to? Diane, want to hear quickly? Okay. Yeah, I just want to say if anybody who has legal questions, there's Isaac here, Dave McMahon, give them a call. And I, I guess what I want to say is, why do we think? the Rogersville Shale is an issue of big concern. Um, where's the, where's the big, the big yeah, post? It's under here. It's under here. It's under here. Okay. <laughs> okay, so right here, the, the, the bottom of the green point, 
In 1975, Exxon drilled a test well there. It's a little over 11,000 feet deep. And most of the information that other companies who are drilling test wells in the Rogersville, most of that, most of the information they got came from that Wayne County test well. And um, last year, the Kentucky Geological Survey had a convention focused on the Rogersville. And um, they came out with a lot of information. Some of you may have picked up a sheet like this. Okay. Um, the Kentucky Geological Survey says that uh, a viable petroleum system exists in the Rogersville. Um, and again, 15,000 feet deep. Uh, all the damage you saw from drilling about 5,000 feet deep uh, at, in, in the Marcellus. Um, another interesting thing is that uh, the Kentucky Geological Service said and they said that um, there is a viable petroleum system in the Rogersville, but the depth might be too great in some areas, and that you have to look really closely at the total organic carbon that is in the results, the testing results. And on another industry site, there was one party trying to sell another party an interest in a um, oil well in Wayne County, and they said it's closer to the Exxon Wayne County test well and has a higher total organic carbon than any other test well in the Rogersville. So to make that a little simpler maybe, there, there have been industry folks saying to each other online that um, this area right here, Wayne County, uh, across the river in Lawrence County, Kentucky, has oil. And um, our interest, first of all, is that people not get screwed uh, by signing leases that end up causing a lot of problems. But our interest is also, shouldn't people who live in this area, shouldn't like people have a right to say, well, you know what? We'd really rather not have this whole area full of deep oil fracking. Yeah. I mean, if, if, if we do nothing, um, and everything I've seen online from the industry sites and others that have looked, before they realized we were looking, um, makes it look like there's a big oil deposit down there. And um, the big oil companies still have a hell of a lot of money. Um, even with the even with the low lower crude oil prices now, a lot of the smaller oil companies are struggling. But the bigger oil companies are buying up the smaller ones, and the bigger oil companies now, it's like the easy to frack oil is already being tapped. Um, those wells are going to start running out not too many years down the line, and so the oil companies are looking for the hard to frack oil. Just like when the coal industry in West Virginia started to have already mined out the easy coal, they started blowing up mountains and dumping the tops into streams, the mountaintop removal. Thousands of people, thousands of people, have been displaced from their homes and communities in southern West Virginia by mountaintop removal, and the regulators think it's just fine. So I, I use that example because if 
if people don't band together and try to keep our area livable and safe, we could be the next, um, it could be like the next mountaintop removal, except they're not going up, instead they're going down. May I ask you a question? How did New York uh, ban the, the... Yeah, practice? New York, the state of New York has banned fracking. The state of Maryland has a moratorium, no fracking there, and one of the New England states, either New Hampshire or Vermont. Oh. How, how do we go about doing that? Yeah. How do we do well, that? Well, I, I, I don't know all the details of how it happened, but I know it was ordinary people that may have happened. Yeah. Yeah.